Welcome to episode number six of Forged in the Fire. This show was specifically designed to hear from people who are high achievers uh, because life and success are not linear journeys. And our guests will be sharing their journey of how they've walked through fire to be forged into their best selves, the same way that a blacksmith forges a lump of steel into a sword. So I've got my buddy Tino on here, really excited to hear more about his story and dive into the backstory of, of how he has gotten to where he's at now. Uh, Tino is a real estate investor here in the Phoenix market and, um, you know, killer sales guy as well. So um, hope you guys get a lot of value from this and, and learn from somebody that has achieved a lot of success in a very short amount of time. So uh, Tino, why don't you kind of bring us back uh, and talk about where you grew up and what that was like? For sure. Yeah. First of all, I just want to say thanks for having me on. I'm excited to kind of dive into I like the premise of the podcast, right? The Forged in Fire. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm excited to dive in, but I grew up in LA. So um, come from like a very, I would say lower class. Like we we kind of bounced around um, family all over like Compton, um, Pomona. And so my childhood was a lot of like, it was a lot of work, dude, to be honest. Like my dad worked 12 hour days. Um, I learned a lot of grit from my childhood, but there was also a lot of struggle. So, okay. um, but I, I think it honestly prepared me for wholesaling, mm -hmm. like it really prepared me for life in general, but like the idea of grinding things out and sticking it out, like that was my dad's motto. And in the first 18 months of wholesale, I didn't do a single deal. I don't know if you knew that. Did you know that? I did not know that. No. Dude, that so I started October of 2018. Okay. And didn't, didn't close a deal, get paid until April of 2020. Holy shit. Yeah. Dude, that's a mental battle to go through. Holy smokes. Bro, and I had like six contracts fall through so i i locked them up we opened a bastro we thought they were good deals and then they fell apart so like after one you're like okay it happens but then after six okay. i was starting to think like dude is this shit real like is this ever gonna work so yeah dang dude i did not know that part yeah well i want to jump back into that in a little bit but yeah is Compton really like what it what they portray it to be, or not really? Uh, it is and it isn't. So like during the day, if you just like stay to yourself, you won't get into too much trouble. But if you're looking for trouble, um, you'll definitely find it. Like the weird thing for people to understand is like certain colors fly in certain neighborhoods and they don't in others. So like you gotta kind of worry about that a little bit but if you're in your house by like dark that's kind of when all the crazy stuff comes out but right. it was really bad like in the 80s and 90s but when we were there um my grandma still lives there like that's where we go for christmas and stuff okay it's not so bad anymore because i've i've always heard and again this is i'm a, I'm a minnesota kid so I, I don't know anything about you know that side of things um you know, as far as like Compton and what, what it's really like, I've been to like, um, Slauson and was it Nipsey hustles corner. Basically I went over there and I was like, yeah. Oh shit, this is, this is a little different. Uh, yeah. Cause I was dude. I, and this is when I was, I was probably 22 at this time, just very naive. Cause I grew up, you know, out kind of by the country. Okay. And, I, I got out of my car. I was like the only white kid. I was like, Oh, and then like, I was also driving a Mercedes. I, I bought it for myself. It wasn't like my parents bought it for me. You know, I, I, I bought that for myself working really hard. And I was like, okay. And this is after Nipsey got shot. Like I, I was a huge Nipsey hustle fan. Uh, still am. I really like his music yeah. and uh, I, I like his messaging too. Uh, but anyways, where I was going with that is like, I, I didn't really know like what I was, what I was walking into when I went over that. I was just like, Oh dude, like this is, I, I just wanted to go and see the shop and like, see if they still had the shop open. Cause I wanted to buy a shirt. Yeah. They didn't. Uh, but anyways, going back to it, 
we always heard that like Compton, like you don't stop at the corners. Like you, you just keep driving. Yeah. So where we lived was um, Long Beach. So Long Beach Boulevard and Rosecrans. And then the next okay. one over was Com- Compton Boulevard. Um, on Long Beach Boulevard at night, you, you'll see like prostitutes out. Like it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Like there are some bad areas there's some bad pockets and, but I don't know. I just, it's different when you like are around it so mm-hmm. much. Cause like, I have a couple friends that they're like, dude, next time you go to Compton, can you like to visit your grandma? Can you take me? And when they get there, they're like, this is nothing that I thought it was going to be like. So I don't know. There there's, I feel like it was hyped up because of easy E and like all the rappers mm-hmm. and they kind of started cleaning it up. And then there's other cities that are actually worse than Compton now. So interesting. But, yeah there's there's some trouble to get into though yeah <laughs> did you ever get into trouble growing up or or did you try and stay away from that a little bit so we actually moved to arizona because i was starting to get into trouble okay uh, starting to hang around with the wrong crowd there the culture is like you go through elementary once you get to middle school if you're if you're like a minority whether you're black or mexican mm kind of start getting recruited like there's gangs that are in high school that like filter down through high school and so when you're in middle school they start kind of like looking at you like hey you know essentially start recruiting you dude and so i started hanging out the wrong crowd um doing stupid stuff like yeah i i got into some trouble um got arrested a few times and Finally, my dad was like, dude, you're not going down this path. We're moving to Arizona. We ended up in Surprise, Arizona. And just like you were culture shocked, I was culture shocked. Like, I mean, I bounced around when I left. We were, I was going to school in Pomona. But either way, like, I had never really, like, heard of country music. I'd never seen so many white people. I'd never seen cornfields. So really, it was definitely a good move for me because if I would have hung around the crowd that I was hanging around, I was definitely going to fall into, I don't know, jail or, or dead. But, um, but yeah. Well, I'm glad you didn't and you followed a, a good path. Thank my dad. My dad, my dad's a smart one. Yeah. So you, t- you talked a little bit about like the struggle that you guys went through when you were growing up. Do you mind elaborating on that or do you not want to touch on that? No. Yeah. Um, so my mom and dad actually, they grew up like dirt poor. Like my dad, I don't know if he's joking or not, but he talks about like on Fridays, they would have Doritos as a family as like a treat. And so like my, you know, they both lived in the projects and stuff like that. And so I saw my dad progress from an entry level construction job where You know, we never had extra money. They always had enough to provide. Like, and that's the thing when you're younger, you don't understand that you don't have a ton of money. You just like, you eat food, you get one pair of shoes a year. Um, You go shopping probably for clothes once a year for school. And like, you assume that's normal. You think that's what everybody else does. And then when I got older, I realized, oh shit, like we, we had enough to get by, but we were never thriving. Yeah. Um, And so I mean, I wouldn't say we were, were dirt poor, but like, you know, we, we definitely rationed. And then I saw my dad go from entry level to like five, six years ago, he started his own business. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I guess the struggles were like, I don't know. I don't know how to like word it properly, but the environment that we were in, I was trying to be a follower. My dad was pretty strict. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was a fun upbringing. I had a, mine was similar. I didn't grow up in Compton, but I, so I grew up in a, like an area that was, when you think of like Scottsdale, think of that in like Minnesota. Okay. Okay. But I wasn't one of the like rich kids. Like my mom, she had enough kind of like you described to get by, but it like, it was like, used equipment for sports yeah. oh we can't put you in that sport because it costs too much money oh 
uh, we can't do that because it costs too much money. Hey, let me see if the school will give us a scholarship so you can go on this field trip Mm -hmm. or like, you know, a scholarship for in, in middle school and high school. Actually, I've never talked about this on a podcast. I had, my mom had to get like money from the school to pay for my food. So it wasn't like when yeah. I was at school, like it was, it was like that. And nobody really knew in high school, at least that I know of just like my guidance counselor and stuff. So it was, it was different, but so I was like surrounded by money, but it, you know, and, and I didn't have a horrible childhood. I didn't have a great one. You know, we grew up in a big house, but it was like, my mom was always struggling to make ends meet and like went through this huge remodel when we were growing up that like sucked all of the money out. And then she was constantly in court with my dad and my sister's dad trying to get child support or like custody battles and all this bullshit. And so it was, it was like never enough. Yeah. So like, I guess to elaborate on that, like, so when I was born, I like, we were so poor that I didn't have a crib. I didn't have my own bed. We were living in a studio apartment and my parents would put me in one of the drawers of their, um, of their, like where they put their clothes. Mm -hmm. And that's where I slept. That was my bed. They would just like put blankets inside, leave it open. And like, that was my crib, I guess. Right. So, but like really quickly, my dad, my dad has a ton of ambition. Um, and so he's actually my hero. Hold on, buddy. I'm talking. Okay. Um, he has a ton of ambition and he, he just like forced himself to win. Like when he started, he was shooting wires. I don't know if you know what like suspended ceilings are, but like the tile yep. ceilings. Yep. So entry level is like you shoot wires all day, every day. And then somebody has to teach you how to be able to uh, lay it out and, and hang the T-bar for you to make more money well they they wouldn't do it so one day one of the guys didn't show up and my dad while he was wires he would like pay attention how they were doing the t-bar so yep. he kind of like taught himself and the superintendent goes hey we don't have another t-bar guy but like, is anybody else trained? can somebody step in and so he did it and from there he just kept leveling it up so like by the time i was 13 14 I would, I would say we were middle class, but I was raised with those same values of like, we don't have a ton of money. Like I got a scholarship for every, I played baseball. Mm-hmm. So we played travel ball baseball and most teams that I was on, I got a scholarship because we couldn't afford the freaking fees and flying everywhere. So um, that was like our mentality. I had to do baseball to get a scholarship, to go to college, to get out of my situation. Like that was the, that was hammered into me. So, but I mean, dude, I'm grateful for it, to be honest. I am too. Not a lot of, it sounds like not a lot of abundance, but a lot of learning hard work as you were growing up. Yeah. And my dad would take me out and do construction with him every summer. Mm-hmm. And he, dude, sometimes he's, he'll still ask me to go help him. Um, and his thing was like, hey, I'm going to show you that if you don't go use your mind, you're going to have to work with your hands for the rest of your life. Yep. So I was super grateful for that. My parents, like I said, they come from a dirt poor background, but my dad's mindset was always so far ahead. Like all he cares about is the legacy. And so, yeah, it it was, it wasn't the worst childhood. We were definitely, um, you know, we were, we were tight on things, but it was, it was good. And we were happy. Humble beginnings. Yeah. Heck yeah. And so you moved, so you were, you born in Compton, raised out in LA, moved out to Arizona. What was next for you guys then? Or what was next for you more specifically? Yeah. So I moved to Arizona and I was 16. Um, I was getting into the wrong crowd, trying to do initiation gang type stuff. There was, there was a gang that was in the neighborhood and, Um, then from there we went to Arizona and like the focus was to almost reinvent myself. Like I wanted to get away from that mindset. My dad, my parents did. And so I just really focused on baseball. Um, and baseball has always been a passion, but from there it was like, be really good at baseball to go division one and then potentially go pro. And that was, dude, that was like, 
it was manifesting, right? At 17, I went to ASU, um, pitched well. They didn't offer me a massive scholarship, but they said, hey, like, we'll give you a little bit, but you're almost like a preferred walk-on with a, you know, a small scholarship, but you have a spot. And then my senior year, I hurt my elbow through one inning, and every offer fell off the table. And so... In high school, that, that happened? Yeah. And so... That's kind of devastating because my parents, dude, we didn't have the money to go to college. So they're like, either you get a scholarship and go to college or you join the army because it's, it's one of those two. And so um, a guy that was recruiting me to Air Force Academy ended up going to a smaller school in Kansas City. And he found out that I had nowhere to go. And he's like, dude, I'll take a chance on you if you take a chance on my school, which it's a small NAI school. Okay. And so I ended up doing that. Um, I got a nursing degree there. That was another thing. Like my parents pushed security for my entire life. Like, hey, go get a good job, get a good degree, get a good job, 401k, retire when you're 65. And that never sat well with me. Like even when I got into college, I didn't know what entrepreneurship was, but I knew I didn't want to work for the rest of my life or somebody. Yep. And so in college, I actually, I joined an MLM called Amway. Have you ever heard of Amway? Not, not like a ton, but I, I have heard the name. Yeah. So it's essentially like you're recruiting, right? You build a team and, but that's really where I got my first taste of like self-development. What's a business owner. I didn't stick with Amway because I didn't agree with some of the stuff that that specific group did, mm -hmm. but after that I couldn't. I couldn't just go back to regular life. So I came back out to Arizona, did nursing for five years, and then ran into a Cody Sperber ad. <laughs> Dude, same. It was Cody Sperber and uh, Dean Graziosi were, were some that I kept seeing over and over and over again. Yeah. So I bought his basic like mentorship package, or not mentorship package, but like the, the course, you know, like the $500 course. Yep. And they tried to do, they tried to pitch me like the mentorship, and I, it was pretty expensive back then. I didn't have any money. So I passed up on it, found somebody that was, that was doing well here. I thought that was doing well. And uh, I went and knocked doors for him. That's where I started, dude. I started knocking doors. I had some success as far as like reaching out to sellers pretty quickly, but I just, I could never get that payday. Touche. Was that the guy that I know about or somebody else? You know Zayback. Oh, yeah. Yep. So during the process of trying to sell me the mentorship, whoever the salesman was, he was saying, hey, you probably shouldn't do a business in Arizona. This guy named Austin Zayback does really well here. There's too much competition. Go elsewhere. And so I heard that and I just, I kept DMing him like, hey, dude, I'll come fucking work for free. I just want to learn. And I, I think I bugged him for like three or four months. And finally he was like, all right, come knock doors. And so I was one of the first two guys that worked for him. Okay. And I was there for on and off for like a year and a half. Um, like I said, we got some contracts. I think whatever happened, it just fell through. He's a good guy. Yep. Uh, he crushes it now. Um, and I think he was new in his journey too. Sure. So it was a mix of that. But I'm again, I'm grateful for that too, though. Like I used to make 200 dials a day. Like we didn't have VAs back then. Mm -hmm. So I was the cold caller and I was cutting my teeth on pissed off sellers in Arizona. And so I learned really quickly how to talk to sellers, even though it didn't translate to money. But then when I got into a system that worked, that translated really quickly. So touche. Was that was that before or after you were a nurse or during? During. So the nice thing about nursing is it's three twelves. So I had four days off. So the four days that I had off, I was like cold calling all the time. You put me on Zen call. Yep. It was like to the point where if we had a family outing on Saturday or Sunday, my wife would drive there so I could call on my laptop. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then when we get there, I'd go lock myself in a room upstairs or something for a couple mm. hours and call. So I was, yeah, I was putting in the work. Definitely. It sounds like it. So mentally, what was that like when you were going through the, uh, like the 18 months of, of trying, putting in the work, but not getting 
quote unquote anywhere with it. And you were just, you're grinding it out, putting in all this work and it just wasn't producing the result you were looking for. Honestly, it felt like everything else I had tried before that. So like I did crypto for a little while. Okay. And I don't know if you bought crypto or anything, but oh, yeah. back in 2014 or 2013, I bought a bunch of XRP for X, whatever. Triple. Yep. Um, yeah. And I thought I was going to get rich and it didn't do anything. And so like, this was kind of like similar. I got into wholesaling thinking, man, I'm going to get rich really quick. It's super simple. Um, and it just, it, it was like normal at that point. Cause I hadn't found success. Right. And I don't know if I was just stubborn or I don't know what it was, but I, the option of quitting never really came into my mind. Like I, it was my last shot at success because I had tried a bunch of other businesses before and failed. And so I was like, I'm getting older. You know, we're starting a family. Like whole wholesaling has to be it. Like this is something that I'm going to try and, and succeed at or I'll fucking die trying. Right? I like so it. The mindset was just keep going. It was, it was a little tough because like I would get excited after getting a contract and I'd go tell my wife. I'd be like, babe, I think this is the one. It's going to like change our life. And it would fall through. And so my biggest thing was like, I hope she doesn't lose faith in me or like feel like I'm just somebody that's blowing smoke. Yep. That was the hardest part is she was like super supportive and I didn't want her to lose faith. I haven't heard that one yet, but that, yeah. I mean, that that probably had to be very tough to to be in that position. Of like wanting wanting so so bad to succeed and selling her on the vision and then she's like okay you keep trying this and it's failing like yeah because that dude i was on? like i said the four days i was off i was literally like i told her babe the next five years you're probably not going to see as much of me as you want to but like i have to figure this out and so she made sacrifices too she had to we have an 11 year old um you know she had to obviously take care of him and so every bit of my success is 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 also hers you can sure. open this. let's go back to the part you said about you had tried other businesses and they they didn't work out how many other businesses and like what were they so i tried a landscaping business okay that didn't work well, mainly because I didn't know how to do real landscaping, like like project landscaping. It was just like I knew how to cut grass. Yeah. Um, and that didn't work. And then I tried a tile business and that didn't work. And then I tried getting into flipping cars, like buying old school cars, uh, restoring them and, and selling them. And that tanked. I tried the crypto thing. That didn't work well. So I tried like five or six businesses that just went nowhere. Touché. Yeah. Did you did you ever do anything before wholesaling, like as far as entrepreneurship? So I actually did. So I was working on a startup. Um, so before I before I got into like the investing side, I was an agent. I just wasn't making the kind of money that I really wanted to. It was like I was on a team, and it was great experience for me. But and this is an important piece for people to understand. It's like yes, it was great experience, and I sacrificed a lot um, on like taking the whole spread because I was on a 70, 30 or a 50, 50 split, but I learned a ton when I was going through that. So like some of the deals that I got, I think my biggest one was like $8,000, which is a group. That's a good check, good yeah. especially being in it for like a year, maybe a year and a half at that point. But um, most of them were like a couple thousand dollars because it was like 180, 200 thousand dollar houses, $250,000 houses. Cause that's what houses used to be in Phoenix. Like the average home price used to be two to 300,000. Yep. And, uh, so I was selling to first time home buyers and I was just like, shit, there has to be something else more like there, there has to be more. I just, I just want to like, I want to get rich. Um, and before that I, I actually worked in uh, food and beverage for a while. So I, I started as a food runner when I moved to Arizona. I worked my way up to uh, an assistant general manager at a couple of nice places down in Scottsdale. And I ended up just not really enjoying it. Um, one place there was, dude, I was getting like beat up left and right because they had a little bit of a roach problem. And 
yeah, it was not good. And so there were like times where like a burger would get sent back with a cockroach between the bun and the, and the burger patty. Oh. And I was like, fuck, like you can't like, you can't retain a reputation after that. And so I was like, I have my name attached to this. Like I'm trying to like establish myself here. This is not good. And it was a nice restaurant. Like I, I won't say it on camera. Cause I don't, I don't want to put that impression out for other people, but I think they've fixed the problem since. And then, um, I left there because in my marketing class at community college, I found this idea that I really wanted to do, which I still would love to get into it if I could get the funding on it of um, a tint film. Cause I'm, I'm like a huge car nut having a tint film that you could change the lightness and the darkness, darkness of it. And so I did a ton of research on it. I was building out the product. I was um, trying to find a, an engineer to design the product so I could get a prototype and bring that to angel investors. And well, that didn't necessarily work all that well because I didn't know how to raise money. I had no idea where to even start. I didn't have a lot of connections. I had some that were like well to do. Um, in hindsight, I wish I would have pitched this one guy. He actually, he passed away. He was a tech entrepreneur that exited his company that he started at 16 and left, or he exited at like 33 or 34 for like 300 million. And I, I had the opportunity to hang out with him a couple of times and I never pitched him on it. Like, or at least like talk to him and showed him the idea. Cause I, I think it would have been a billion dollar idea hands down without a question, the way that I was trying to build the technology. You should still do some of that. I know. I now that I like understand business a little bit better. I'm not a, like a master pro at it. I, I think I do okay, but um, that and I've learned at least the basics of raising money. Yeah, I think I think it could turn into something. But right now, my focus is real estate. Even though I know that could be possibly way bigger. Um, and then before that, it was you know um, not 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 the best types of businesses. The ones that aren't really legal. So yeah. Import export of, uh, cannabis. Okay. I mean, uh, you're, I like, I'm sure you've heard this, but like a lot of the guys that sold drugs back in the day, or like that I knew of mm -hmm. a lot of great business minds. Like we didn't think it then, but they had distribution. They had like fucking S SOPs. Like it was, yeah. So I think a lot of those guys are really smart. They just never pivoted into the right business. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad I'm not doing that anymore because I don't look over my shoulder at all, at all anymore. And, and it feels so much better. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that was my early start. I didn't, I didn't know you were slanging weed, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of the people from my high school, they, some of them still call me Labizi or La Reefer, and that was like my thing back then. And what? Yeah, I have a. I, I used to have really long hair down on my shoulders, and I've definitely cleaned up my act a lot. Thank God, I would, dude. I would have never guessed that. That's so I'll crazy. tell the story really quick. I know this isn't supposed to be about you, but I kind of want to tell the story now that you're curious about it. Yeah. So I, uh, the reason I left for Arizona is because I was in college and I couldn't find a scholarship or a way to pay for my second semester. I went, I came to ASU. I visited my sister. And so I, I moved across the country after high school, started my life out here and I couldn't pay for college. And so I was still slanging weed in, in college and I was sending stuff in the mail across the country. And then some of that got taken and we lost a bunch of money. And so I moved home to Air, to Minnesota. I was there for a year and a half went back right back to it. I got three possession tickets in a row, two misdemeanors. And then I was charged with a felony three years in a row in the same month. Oh my God. And thank God. Dude, you fit in, in Compton. What's that? You fit in, in Compton. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, but the, the third one was really bad because I, I was charged with a felony because it, it, it wasn't even like I had a lot on me. I had, but I had hash. And hash is a felony in, in Minnesota. And I had maybe like 0.2 grams on me. And yeah. my mom was like, hey, you're getting in trouble a lot. You've been doing this for a long time. And like, you keep getting in trouble. Like, you're going to go to jail or you're going to move away. Like, where are you going to go to college? Because you need to get back in college because I don't want to see this anymore. And my mom was sick at this point. And so she's like, get 
out of Minnesota, get away from these people that you're, you're associating with, lose all their numbers and just go create a new life. And I was like, well, mom, that's going to be in Arizona. I'm not, I don't want to go to school here. She said, okay, go. So I, I, I had a car that I had, I had bought cash, a Mercedes when I was like 19 and I sold it, took the money and I moved across country. Damn. Yeah. That's what it takes. So you got like similar to me leaving LA, like you got to get away from those people. And even mm-hmm. when I was here, I tried to connect with some people because you know this in Arizona, a bunch of people moved from LA here because they were yeah. like selling their houses for way too much there and then buying massive houses out here. Yep. And there were a couple of kids from LA that I could just tell they had the hair nets and everything. And so mm-hmm. I was trying to like sneak my way in to be friends with them. And mm-hmm. my dad cut that pretty quickly, but yep. But yeah, burn your, burn your, what is it? Burn the bridges? Burn your ships. Yeah. Burn the ships, burn the bridges. To backtrack to, I ended up getting the felony dropped. It, I was charged with it. I was never convicted. Um, I, I ha- ended up hiring an attorney that put me on a diversion program. And that's when I started kind of t- turning my life around and i um, very grateful for that moment. Cause it's, it's gone from my record, completely expunged. It's, you can't even find it at this point. So um yeah without me talking about it, but I'm, I'm not shy about it. Cause it, it's just something that I went through and I, I learned that that's not the kind of life that I want to live ever again. Yep. Very, we're, we're very similar. We have to learn the hard way. Yeah. I always have to. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So you've talked about some of the things that you, um, you started with the businesses and, um, and then you eventually linked up with Pace and and started working over there. Was that directly after you left Austin's gig, or or did you? No, have some so I left Austin's gig, connected with Jeff. You know Jeff Dwyer. Yep. Um, he and I, so our wives are like best friends. Okay. Um, and one day we were just talking, and I was I was talking about wholesale. He's like, "No way, you you're trying to wholesale," and I was like, "Yeah." And at that time, he was him and templeton go way back and so he was learning from temp and so we were like why don't we link up like i am good at sales jeff is really good at like integrator stuff okay and so we did and we did a couple of deals and then we ended up going to a meetup one of pace's meetups and i had a deal that fell through with zayback and I pitched it to Pace because I was like, we couldn't do a cash deal on this, but I know you can do something creative. Okay. Can I, can I talk? No, I want to do this. Sorry. Um, so we, I, I kept bringing him like opportunities and he was like, dude, like who do you work for? Whatever. Like, and so I went on a ride along. And at that time it was just him and Cody doing deals. Yeah. I think they had like a couple people knocking for him or something, but they didn't have like an acquisition team. And so Pace was like, dude, why don't you come work for me? Like I'll teach you everything. And so I was his first hire, acquisition manager or um, director, whatever you want to call it. And then I hired, I think we ended up having like eight guys on the team or eight eight members at our full strength. And yeah, it was a good experience. I learned a ton in sales, obviously creative. Um, I say yeah. I turned out. I I unplugged it. So. Oh word. Um. Do you want ice cream after? No, I want to edit this. Please. <laughs> I'll have Paul come edit it. Um. So that's how you learn creative, and and then you you went out on your own because you started doing well over there um, which i think is a natural progression uh when you when you start under somebody i was stupid and i bootstrapped it from the start but (laughs) more power to you i mean i i don't know it was a really good experience and then for me i got into the business to control my time so even though i was doing well i was making a a, like a great living there i walked away from nursing there um at the end of the day i was still working for somebody so it was time for me to go do my own thing. And so I ended up leaving the very beginning of 2021. And I struggled the first like three or four months because I didn't, I didn't know the business of wholesale, right? Like Cody was so good at providing leads that all I had to do was talk to people. 
And so when I left, I was like, shit, I have to go like pull data, figure out how to do VAs, like all this other stuff. So, um, but again, like that four month trial, uh, I, I ended up getting into actually flipping because like I didn't have a wholesale pipeline. So I was like, dude, I got to make money somewhere. Yep. So I started buying up flips just to give myself like a pipeline of money coming in. Yep. Um, and again, I had another experience of something completely separate. Now I can do it. You know, we're really strong in wholesale now. We don't flip as much, but um, yeah. Were you were you raising money at that point to to do them, or were you funding the deals yourself? No. So super grateful for Templeton Walker. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up connecting at a Cinco de Mayo. Like we, I went to a soul pod meetup and then after we kind of all went out and, and drank and wow. Temple's like, dude, I've never hung out with you. Like we have great energy. He's like, let's, let's connect. And so I told him I was wanting to actually start buying more properties and he connected me with his lender that does hundred percent funding. So I wasn't really focused on the raising the private capital. Ah. And then I had a partner at that time that was, he knew business and he did really well in the car business. Like he had a, um, he had a dealership, but he didn't know anything about real estate or wholesale or whatever. So I kind of started talking with him and we connected. And so he was actually doing the majority of the, the private capital stuff. Okay. And I was just going to get the deals. Word. Okay. So, so you started it a couple of times and now you're doing well. If you had some advice for somebody starting out, like going out and starting a new business, doesn't even have to be real estate, but just going out and starting a, a new business, what advice would you have for them? Either pay up, like pay up and find a mentor that's actually doing the business um, or go work for somebody that is actually doing the business. Like there's, dude, Phoenix is the hub for wholesale. I don't know why, but there's so many people that do well here. Like go work for somebody for a year, set the expectation that you're going to be there for a year and then you're gone. But um, that's the fastest way to plug into somebody that's doing well and, and just soak it all in. If not, be prepared to pay up for mentorship to cut the curve because if not, you'll be struggling. Yeah, I agree with that. You, you got to either learn from somebody, whether you pay them or you pay them with your time and a split on, on the deal flow. Shameless plug for both of us. We're probably both hiring. So if you guys yeah. are looking for something, either Tino or I always hiring. Um, and you have a family. You have, Beautiful. yeah, you have two kids, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then Austin's 11. Okay. And then my wife, Amber is an assistant principal. So how do you juggle running your business and also having a, a personal life, like having a, a family that you spend a lot of time with. So I try and separate it as much as possible. Like obviously he's at the office with me and um, this is the last two weeks have been different than normal. Normally he goes to a babysitter. I am here till five. Usually I leave earlier than five and then I'm home and yeah, I'll put out a couple of fires here and there, but like I try and completely separate it because when you're focused on too many things, like your brain scattered and don't really like you're not present. Um, so I just try and set like hard limits of like, okay, I'm only going to be at the office till five um, at the latest. When I get home, I'm going to try and put my phone away at least for the first hour. But it's easier said than done, dude. You know, business never sleeps. So um, my wife has to to remind me sometimes, but. Yeah, I got that reminder last night on a walk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I was having a similar conversation with, with Lacey about like the distraction thing. Like when you're, because uh, I, I struggle with staying really on target. So I've had to kind of put systems in place to uh, to keep my focus on, on something for a while because I, I can't remember which book it was, but the the average, once you distract yourself for like, um, like if you distract yourself for 30 seconds, it's going to take you 15 to 21 minutes to get back on, on 
on your focus. So every mm-hmm. time you have like a distraction come up, like a, an Instagram notification or something come up while you're, while you're working, it takes you 15 to 21 minutes to get your focus 100% back on that. Cause otherwise you have like these lingering thoughts that are like all over the place and it really makes it difficult to get your deep work done. I think that's actually where it came from is deep work. The, okay. the, like, I got to read, read that because I don't know if you have ADHD, but I, I think we've talked about it once. I have ADHD, so I'm Same. like squirrel, 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 squirrel. And it's tough, dude. It's tough, yeah. especially like when you're trying to close files and remember that, hey, I got to reach out to this person for this. And I'd love to, you know, pick your brain on what kind of systems you're putting in place. Because for me, I'm just trying to like, okay. Here's one of them. So I set a timer, um, especially when I'm doing prospecting. Cause like, so for a long time, like I went through like a, I, I wasn't doing the calling. I had a team that was doing everything. And then I went through like burnout last year and I was like, I have to just go back to basics and like, just do this myself for a while. Um, uh, so now as I'm prospecting, I, um, and I'm back, I'm back as like myself again. I'm like very grateful for that. Cause I was like eight months, months of darkness last year. And, uh, so I set a timer for 30 minutes and then I make my calls. I don't touch my phone. I don't go on Instagram, social media, nothing. It's calls for 30 minutes. And then I take five minutes. And if I have to go to the bathroom or I need to go get more water, or, uh, I want to check my social media because we're all social media addicts these days. Uh, that's when I do that. And then I, I, you know, sometimes my, my timer will go off and I need like another five minutes because I'm like making lunch or something like that, depending on what time it is. Um, and then I go right back to it. And then the next thing that's really helped me is Google tasks. It's an app that you can put on your phone. So I created, I I'm a big Andy Frazella guy, and he talks about this thing called the power list, which is five critical tasks that you have to get done every single day to, for your business. And it can be completely different tasks every single day. But, um, for me that that's one of my lists that I have in Google tasks. I also have like a daily non-negotiables that I'll go through with like my meditation, my prayer, uh, journaling, reading. Uh, I have this book called Jesus, Jesus calling that I read, uh, just like one daily devotional every day. Um, yeah. And then like my January letter at the, in, in the night. Um, and then I have a reminders thing where I'll put all my reminders in there. That's like, Oh, like I just have this thought come up and I'm like, I have to do this, <laughs> but it's not today. So I'll set it out for a, a few days. And that's really started helping me. I start, I implemented that probably like a month ago uh, because I used to have this app called Todoist, but it's $50 a year uh, to have that app and Google tasks is free. So I found this one. And I was like, why am I spending $50 a year? Like, sure, I, I can, and I used to, but I have so many other subscriptions that I pay for. Like, why not? We're in a, we're in inflationary periods right now. Like, why not just save some money on it and, and find something that is just a, as effective? Yeah. Um, so those are like two of the things uh, that, that I use that have really helped me a lot. I'm trying to focus on this. So we're very similar, I think, with our distractions. Mm-hmm. If I wake up with a plan of what I'm going to do that day, I execute really well. But if I wake up and I did not plan my day or I wake up late and I'm off my, my routine, mm-hmm. then I get distracted easily. Like I wake up and I look at my phone and I get in the shower and I'm stuck on my phone for 30 minutes. And the next thing you know, I'm like lollygagging around the house. So I have to be a routine person, but I... I don't know if you struggle with this, but after a while, routine drives me insane. Like I have to, I have to get out of it for a little bit, mm. get back into it. Yeah. I wish I could kill that part of me. Dude, same. I like once a year, I'll, cause I'll go through a period where it's like, I get up between four and five. And then there's another period of the year where it's like, I have to sleep longer. So I wake up at like six to 7 AM and I, <gasps> But I like, I, that's like when I, if I really burn out and I'm like, I just need more time. I'm not like, I'm not in it. So right now what I'm trying to implement is the 12 week year. That's a book that I'm reading right now. I'm going through all the exercises and that's one of my things on my power list is to finish that. So I can start that next week um, because I'm a big creature of habit. I, I need like a goal that I can sprint to that feels like a bit of a stretch, but is, is attainable. And I know that I've done something similar before, just maybe a little bit bigger this time. Um, so that's, that's that, but I always try and stick to a morning routine of a sort, even if I'm like really loose in it. 
and how I, if I get like way off on it, I set alarms and it pisses Lacey off so bad because I have alarms go off at 4.50, 5 o'clock, 5.20, 6.35, 6.50, 7.15, 7.50 to like keep me on task because otherwise like I'm just everywhere. But now once I've dialed it back in with this Google Pass app, now I don't need those quite as much and I've turned off a lot of them. But if I go through a period where it's like I... I'm not on it. I set a lot of alarms because it annoys me so much that I'm like, okay, I have to get back on my shit. Oh, dude, that's smart. That's good. Cause Try that out. I don't do any of that shit. I write a to-do list and I hope I get it done. Most of the time I do, I'll be honest. Like, um, If I have a to-do list, I'm very intentional and I knock it out early because I... So when I first got into the business, I was like, grind, 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 right? And now that I have a family, I'm getting older. I want to make money and provide a good lifestyle, but I also want to spend time with my family. That's the whole reason I got into this. And so I really started to focus like, okay, if I, can I knock my work day out in five or six hours mm -hmm. and, then, and then go home and relax or you know, hang out with the family? Um, but dude, it's tough. It's like a net. It's like a always changing game like i once i feel like i'm figuring it out and i'm like on a routine it's almost like self-sabotage i like throw myself off off track you know so yeah. it's that and you sometimes you'll get like rug pulled where it's like like this has happened to me a couple times where like things are going really well and then i kind of start slacking and then i also get like loose on my habits and i i've started getting way more into my faith and so like when i walk like away for, for my faith because i'm too busy then it's like rug pull. Oh shit. Everything just changed. Now I have to rethink everything in my life and I have to restart. I don't know if that happens for you too. Dude, yeah. I, and that goes with like the routine and like staying disciplined. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a machine when I'm disciplined, like, and I'm actually happier. And I, it's like a, something in my mind that I have to learn how to trigger. Like when I did 75 hard last year and I got super shredded, I, during it, I was happy. I was healthy, but at the end of it, I was like, "Man, I just like I want to drink a beer and like hang out," you know. And then once I did that, getting back to that seventy-five hard version of Tino, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to since. Um, so, it, it, but it's something like I gotta let go of. I feel like I'm letting go of fun Tino if I'm too disciplined, right? Yeah. I know if I'm gonna go to the next level, I have to. Yeah. Sacrifices now for later. Um, 75 hard is like, uh, so I'm on, I think today's day 34. Most of it has been relatively easy kind of it's the diet thing. Cause I love cheese and I love pizza yeah. and the no sugar thing. Everything else is like, okay, but I just really want a fucking cookie. Yeah. I really want a cookie, but I'm like every time, cause I go, when I used to go to home Depot a lot for like picking up materials for the flips and stuff, I would walk in and I'd like, I would get like a Reese's at the end of it when I'm checking out or like just get a stupid candy snack. And now like I'm remodeling my bathroom because I had a water leak in there. And so I went to home Depot the other day and I was like, Oh my God, I want a fucking Reese's like, give me that candy. And I'm like, no, like I committed to doing this. I have to finish this. I'm not going to fail it. Um, That's awesome. The rest of it, it's that. And dude, honestly, the physical exhaustion at the end of the day is really tough. Yeah. It's like, I'll try and read at night. And I don't know if you felt like this when you were going through it, but it's just like, I was starting to get like, I start getting fuzzy eyes when I'm reading and I can't like focus because I'm so tired, but I'm like, I, I just have to get this done. I have to build the self dif discipline and the confidence with this challenge. Yep. Is that what, what it was like for you? Or did you, was there a point in the 75 hard that you broke through that, that exhaustion that your energy just snapped back into place? So right around the period that you're at is when I started to feel normal again. So like the first, I think 25 days, I was like, dude, I don't know if I can do this. Like every bit of me is sore mm -hmm. and I don't know if I can keep doing this. And then, like I said, probably like probably day 40, it, like my body just got used to it. The hardest part for me was drinking the water. Really? Um, Liam, Liam, can you please stop doing that? Every time you do that, it turns my screen black. 
Sorry. Um, am I cutting in and out? He keeps turning the freaking power switch on. It, it doesn't cut in and out, but sometimes your, your uh, service is a little spotty here and there. Well, he hasn't had a nap today. That's um, <laughs> but my, the hardest thing for me was the water. Like if I didn't drink I the water throughout the day, day mm -hmm. I would say probably 10 or 15 of the days I was yeah. chugging water at like 1130 yeah, PM. I really? Yeah. So um, the physical part was hard. I like to drink, to be honest. Like I like to, like Monday through Friday, I probably have like one beer with dinner, or like a whiskey. Um, but on fr either Friday or Saturday, one of the two, we go out with my in-laws or something. We have a couple and have a good time. Yep. That's like my version of okay. I'm gonna stay disciplined for five days. I'm gonna let loose a little bit and then go right back into the week. Yeah. This. So that's really what I wanted to like let loose a little bit, but. Um, interesting yeah like the at like a nice dinner i like to have like a glass of wine or like a, a whiskey if it's like a steak dinner but so like and we haven't been doing that like going out to really nice dinners recently because we've been cooking a lot at home just trying to really monitor what we're eating um but like we went out for my mom's birthday um and you know, usually I'd have like a drink at like a nice dinner. My mom, she, she's not alive. So we were going out for like a, a celebration dinner of her life kind of thing. And, um, I was like, shit, like I really want a glass of wine, but I'm not going to do it. Um, but the water part has actually been surprisingly very easy for me. I'm like a camel. I just drink water like all the time. Mm -hmm. And I have a, I have one of the RO systems at home. So like water, like I always have really good clean water at home and I just fill up my hydro flask and I, Normally it's like 11 a.m. and I've already drank all my water for the day. That's impressive. Yeah, not me. I, I mean, when I'm thirsty, obviously, like water is amazing. But for me, mm -hmm. I like flavor, so it was like forcing water down my throat. But and then I would I would do a lot of the water drinking when I was working out. So like in the morning, I would do cardio outside, and then at night, I would do a strength workout. Okay. And that's when I was chugging a lot of water because I do like very high intensity lifting. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but that was that was the hardest for me is water, reading not so much, um, and the diet. Like I love to eat. Mm -hmm. I did a looser version, I guess, than you did because I did macros. So like, I don't think I would have been able to do seventy five days without some of the foods that I eat. So I just said, okay, if it fits your macros. As long as I stay within my macros, I'm okay. So it allowed me to do a little bit different on the diet. Yeah. Mine, and I'm, I'm not like stupid strict on mine. I've had a lot of, so I started ordering a meal prep service so that it, it was easier for me. I'm not doing it right now because um, I I found like a couple of meals that I actually want to cook at home. So mine is like no added cheese. Like if it's in the recipe, it's in the recipe, but like, I'm not, I'm not going out of my way to like add Parmesan cheese on top or like eating a handful of cheese. I'm a Minnesota kid. So that's like fucking normal for us weirdos. Um, and, and also I used to eat like sandwiches for breakfast. I'd have a bagel and a, uh, an English muffin. And then I'd have a sandwich for lunch. And then sometimes I'd have a sandwich for dinner. So I'm like, okay, no more sandwiches, no pizza, you know, none of that. Um, and trying to reduce like how much dairy and, and bread that I'm eating, but I still eat a lot of pasta. Uh, so, you know, whatever, but um, Italian food and Mexican was not something I was willing to give up. Those are my two favorite cuisine cuisines ever. So. Preach bro. I can't give up. I did. I ate tacos through my 75 hard, but I just made sure to like, you know, stay within my macros. Like the nice thing is I could eat like, eat tacos for lunch and still be with my macros. Yep. So I ate a ton of tacos through seven, five hard. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's been interesting. Cause like I, I seen like my body progression, it's like, Holy shit. Like, you know, when I started, like, I wasn't like, I, I, I'm, I'm a natural, like my, my metabolism is extremely fast and I have extremely low blood sugar. So I'm like completely anti-diabetic and, um, 
I was gonna and say so, like, you always look lean. Like I've never yeah, I've always been lean, but like I had like a little little small layer like under my shirt, but like my arms look good and like everything else. But like my shirt, like under my shirt, like I had a small layer over like my abdomen and like it's just like shredded in like a couple of weeks. I was like, damn, dude, I look good again. Dude. <laughs> like I'm 22 I, again. When I started, I was like two two oh seven. By the time I was but after 75 days, I think I finished at 187. Holy I haven't been down to 187 since like college baseball. Dang. It was, yeah, it was amazing. I look shredded. I, I think I started at like 184 ish and I'm at like one. I fluctuate between like 189 and like 191. Oh, nice. Okay. So, You're gaining some lean muscle too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I really like. Yeah. Really like that. Um, wanted to touch back on this. What, what would you say is like some of the, not some of, what is the hardest thing that you've overcome in your life? Again, something that you want to talk about. If, if it's really personal, you don't have to, but if you want to talk about something like that, you're welcome to. Um, I guess, I don't know. I was, I, so in college, I was a bit of a fighter. Um, got into some trouble with the law. Like, I mean, if you look up my my record, you can see it all there. But um, the hardest thing I had to overcome was just making better decisions, dude. Like, it, I'm very impulsive, or I've been very impulsive in the past, and I was raised with like this aggressive mentality, and I realized that I needed to tone it down. So I. I've never told this to anybody, like a couple people know this, but I was banned from Westgate for like three years. Whoa. Yeah. So I went there. My girlfriend at the time went to the restroom and I, um, I went there to just stand and wait for her. And all of a sudden like the bouncer grabs me and like pulls me out and I had only had a couple drinks. And so I was like, what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, somebody said that there was a drunk person standing by the woman's restroom. And I was like, not me so he ended up being wrong but i was pissed off and so um i started getting loud and they called the police over and they trespassed me off the property and when i feel like i'm being i'm being wronged um and i'm right like my ego kicks in and so i was trying to explain it to the officers and they weren't having it. obviously they just assumed that i was drunk and so long story short I did not go willingly off the property. Uh, the police officer went to like physically move me and I got into an altercation with him and ended up breaking his thumb. Oh, shit. Um, so I got arrested. I had to pay for a really good lawyer to avoid uh, an assault on a police officer. Um, so I didn't get a felony. I ended up getting a misdemeanor for it and, I'm not embarrassed to, sh to like tell that. I mean, I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm also not embarrassed because everybody has a past and I think I've, I've learned from it or I hope I've learned from it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was really tough because I thought I was a nurse at, a t at the time and I thought I was going to lose my license. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, um, I thought I was going to have to go to jail for a long time. It was, it was scary. But yeah, I would say that, that's the biggest it's the biggest hurdle life I've had as a recent, I guess. How did you handle that? I guess. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but like when you get into trouble, you're just like, why, why did I do that? Like if I would have just did this, like I've, I've told myself that so many times and finally that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I was like, Tino, like, it jarred me to like, Hey, you have to change. And so that's really when I started looking into wholesaling and like business and self-development. Um, and so I just handled it by like, okay, I made a mistake. Um, just be better. Like, don't do that again and really hold yourself to it instead of just saying, Oh, I'm going to be good. Cause in the past, like I would do something dumb and um, I, I would tell myself I'm going to be good. And then I'd be good for like a month or two and then go do super shit again. Mm -hmm. Now I just had to prove to myself, like you can do this. And so that's, 
I, I mean, again, forged in the fire, right? Like I, I'm happy that I went through it because I didn't have a family at that time. Like I, she was not my wife. That's one of my exes. And so mm-hmm. if I would have been with my wife at the time, like things could have been totally different. Like I could have been looking at jail time with kids. So I'm yeah. glad I learned that lesson. Yeah. I, and to, to what you said, like, I'm not sure or when you say, I'm not sure if I've ever been there. I, when I got the letter, cause when I moved away to Arizona after I was charged with the, the third possession, um, my mom called me one day. She's like, Hey, are you sitting down? I was like, cause they hadn't like, I went to jail. I was released. Like I, w- I was in jail for like a little bit. It was like, it wasn't even a day. It was like a few hours. And I called my mom and she's like, what the fuck? Like, I told you this is going to happen. Blah, 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 blah. I moved away four or five months later, she gets a letter in the mail. I'm living down here. And she's like, Hey, are you sitting down? Like, I need to talk to you about something. I was like, no, but okay. Now sit down. What? And I was on the top of a mountain and she like, I was hiking. I used to hike every day uh, when I moved here and she's like, Hey, so the, I got the letter from, you know, the courts or whatever. Um, you have a court date this day. You're going to have to come back. You might be facing jail time. And I was like, shit. Yep. That was like my, Oh shit moment. Like I got to stop doing like stupid stuff. Like I can't be, I can't be doing this anymore. And then it was like, I didn't fully learn from that. Like, you know, like you said, you were, you were bad. And then, you know, you learn. And I actually didn't learn, learn until years later. Uh, you know, she, I went back and then I got like the sentencing of like, it wasn't even a sentence because I never pleaded. I never was convicted, nothing like that. It was just like, Hey, in lieu of this, you're getting this. But if you, if you mess up, you're facing up to six months in jail. I was like, Oh shit. And so, and again, it was for a small amount. It wasn't even that much. And then it was like right around the the time when my mom passed that I was like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with this shit at all anymore. Like at all. This is done. And I was like, I wasn't even really involved in it. It was just like, so I could smoke for free and whatever back then. But then when she died, it was like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with this. Like I have to turn my life around. I need to make a change. My life is going to continue going nowhere if I have nowhere to go. And so I turned it around and thank God I did. Yeah. Every, every failure I've had has led to some type of success. I will say that Mm -hmm. Um, I've been in trouble with the law more times than I can. I or more times than I can admit, I guess, but, um, Every time I did something, it like it sparked something new in me. And so I don't ever, I don't ever regret anything. Like, do I wish I probably would have done less stuff? Yes. I think I would be more successful now at my age if I would have straightened out my head younger. Mm-hmm. But who knows, dude? Um, yeah. And even now, I'm not perfect. Like, I still have a little bit of a temper, and my wife hates it. Like, if somebody cuts me off on a, you know, while we're driving, I'm just, I was raised aggressive, like either you eat or you'd be eaten or, or you get eaten. And so like that instinct kicks in and I just like, I, I almost lose it. Right. Like not road rage, but I get very aggressive. And so I'm trying to like calm that down and just be better all around, dude. But yeah, it's a never ending game. I agree with that. Cause I, I definitely in the same way, if I get like cut off or like, if somebody is just like driving stupid, like I'm, I start making my comments and Lacey's like, it's not that big of a deal. Like chill out. I'm like, no, but it is. It's a big deal. Like when I drive, like I have to win. Like I'm, I'm, I'm racing everybody, but no, I'm not, I'm not actually racing everybody, but, but, um, where was I going to go next? I forgot. Um, oh, what I was going to say is like for like the listeners to know, you know, and I are not just having this conversation about like the trouble that we got in or things that we went through because we're glorifying them. We're, we're glorifying what came out of that because both of us have come a very long way from it. And the, the whole premise of this podcast is that you can go through hell. You can go through a lot of things. You can maybe not be your best self. And you, you have a point in your life where you can turn that around. You have the, the power and the ability to do anything you set your mind to. 
as long as you're willing to make the change and you're willing to take the actions necessary to go from maybe you're not the best person right now to, hey, you know what? My future can be different and my future will be different if I'm willing to to surround myself with better people, if I'm willing to learn from my mistakes, if I'm willing to learn new things that can help me get from where I'm at to where I want to be and casting a vision of what that's going to look like. So just wanted to put that out there because we're not sitting here glorifying drug use or aggression or anything like that. What we're doing is talking about it because we're not ashamed of what we've been through because we know we're not ever going back to that. And that's the greatest part about it is because we learned through getting forged in the fire of, Hey, I made a mistake. I learned from the mistake. I want a better future. I'm working towards my better future. And now I'm living my better future. Oh yeah. And dude, I completely agree. Like, I don't ever want to glorify even, I really don't tell too many people that I'm from Compton or whatever. Like, Mm -hmm. and I don't know, like I moved around a lot. So like Compton is our headquarters, if you will, for the Luna family, because that's where my grandma lives. Yep. But I lived in Compton, I lived in Pomona, I lived in Rialto, like we moved a lot. Um, so I'm not like this crazy badass kid that like, you know, glorifies the gang life or, or being a, a dummy, like, but um, it happened. And I'm hoping that somebody sees this as going through something similar and they think, hey, I'm just a failure. And like, no, you can change your life around whenever you want. Like, yep. I was one mistake away from probably being in a cell, especially when I, and it wasn't like I, I fought the officer, by the way. I don't want people to be like, he's such a piece of shit. No, he just, right. he tried to grab me and I like, pulled away from him really quickly and it just popped. And then uh, after that, I was like physical, right? But that could have changed my whole life. Like I could have got five, seven years and I'm grateful that I didn't. And I, I owe it to myself to make something better of my life because I got that chance. And here's another thing that I wanted to talk about with that is everybody has a story and the people that go through the most are called to do more. If you go through a lot of stuff and maybe you, you just don't see a way out, or maybe you're thinking you're a failure, you're down on yourself. Cause I've been there. I'm sure you probably have been there too. Like when I go through a lot of things, especially when I look back on like my story, which like I'll summarize it really quick. My dad left when I was one or two years old. I haven't seen him since I was four. My mom died when I was 22. I watched my mom lose everything because of her fighting to death in the court system and her, you know, uh, doing a remodel during the 2008 crash. We, we started remodeling the house in 2006 and the market crashed in 2008 after she re- refinanced every single piece of equity that we had out of the property that she could maximize on equity. You know, seeing that, getting into the, the wrong things, hanging around the wrong people, being known as a drug dealer by everybody in school, including the police liaison. Like I went through a lot of things, you know, almost died many times. You know, I, w- I was, I went through a long period of very harsh, difficult depression. And I realized at one point in there, which was actually the catalyst of, of how I started really turning everything around was when my mom died because my mom, my, my godmom, and I tell people this sometimes, but not all, I haven't told a lot of people this, my godmom, she was leaving the day after my mom died. We had just met with the funeral home and she said, Hey, Alec, you got a choice right now. You can, you can let what just happened absolutely destroy you and you can spiral out of control again, or you can make this the the turning point where you go out and you create a better life for yourself. Yeah. And I, like, I, I still like it. Those aren't the exact words, but that's the premise of what she told me. I, that has been a lot of the premise of what, what I look at for my life now that I'm like, Hey, you know what? I've been through too much to continue living like shit. I have to go do something else and create something out of this story because look at all. And and right now I'm still early on my story. I fully believe though, like you and I, we will be able to impact a ton of people because of the story that we have in the past. Because if they look at somebody like us and they say, Hey, he's done it. He might not be any more special or smarter, or, you know, from a better family than I am. I, I could probably do something like that too. And that's why I started this podcast. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. I love it. I love the message. Thank you. Love your story. Um, 
So I got a couple questions before we start wrapping up here. How do you define success? That's a good question. Um, dude, success for me is just fulfilling my purpose. And sometimes I struggle with that with real estate. I don't know if you do, but mm -hmm. I, I make good money, right? Now, it's probably 2021. I've made life-changing money like every year. And I've really mastered the wholesale thing. Um, but it's like deal after deal after deal. I don't wake up like, oh my God, I want to comp these houses. Like I, I struggle sometimes. Like, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? But yeah, I want to build a business and, can, and that stays autonomous. But um, I think success is just finding whatever purpose God had for you and doing it to the best of your ability. So like for me, that might be something different than wholesale. I'll continue to do wholesale because that pays for our lifestyle. Um, but I want to do what God put me on this planet for and do it really well and and bring my family along. Love and it. these guys with a good platform. And hopefully, like my goal, and my dad always said this, is like, you're, you should be better than me like all around, not just financially, but you should be a better man. You should, you know, go through less BS. Like that's the goal, dude, is just to get better every generation. Like I want my legacy to, to continue to build. Do you look at legacy as like a financial thing or a thing that you pass along? Uh, so I, I'm reading, um, what would the Rockefellers do? Yep. Great book. And so I saw in there that like, Typically, it takes three generations for people to lose their wealth, their family yep. wealth. So before that, I thought it was wealth. I have to leave assets for my kids. But now it's, it's, um, it's traits or characteristics, right? Like I want to come up with like some words that our family holds for forever. I, and I want to be somebody that helped change that traje trajectory, right? Um, so I think for me, legacy is more like what impact is he going to have? Cause if he doesn't have any impact, I didn't do my job. Yeah. I love that. And I, I got two things that I want to say on that. So it sounds like you probably listened to Ed Milet and wow. he talks about the one, the one that changes the family tree forever. I'm a huge Ed Milet and Andy Frazella fan. So I listen to them all the time. And he always talks about that is like, I I'm the one, I'm the one. And the other thing that I, I don't, you probably have never heard this because it was a, like a, an event that he talked at, but Sean Whalen had something that he, uh, that his speech last year was at this fund launch conference that I was at for investment funds. And everybody that was up there was like, I want to leave generational wealth. So my kids, kids is and my, my kids is kids and their kids and their kids and their kids have money. And he gets up there and he goes, everybody's talking about how they want to leave money for gen 16 generations down the road. What the fuck do they care about me? What, why do I care about them? 16 generations down, they're going to blow the money. Anyways, they're going to become entitled, spoiled brats. And he's like, what the fuck do I care about that? Congratulations. You won the money game and you failed the life game. I want to be there for my kids on, on at their sports game and at their graduation and being present as a father and teaching them the values that they need to, to have to succeed. And also, um, gosh, what was the other thing that he said? It was so good. Um, I want them to see me building these things so that they see the hard work that it takes to become successful is essentially another one of the things that he talked about. And I, it was probably the best speech that was at that conference. Hands yeah. down. Dude, if you that really stuck with me. If you don't leave those morals and values. Yeah. You, you made a bunch of money, but what, who gives a shit? Like, like your kids are terrible people and they're not going to contribute to society. Yeah. I'm tired. Retired. Okay. Yeah. Um, I won't say their names because this might get back to them. I don't really give a shit though. Um, but like on on part of my family, they're not my blood family, they're blood of my family. They grew up spoiled and entitled because their grandfather gave them a lot of stuff and like passed along businesses and whatever. And then the one that I grew up with, we were cousins, but we're not blood cousins, we're like removed or whatever he 
last time I saw him, he was such an asshole to me, like calling me a peasant, telling me I'm never going to be anything. <laughs> like, I'm worth $30 million. And I'm like, dude, I've, I've seen the, all those businesses that you're talking about were half of my sister's dad's too. I've seen the appraisals. I know that that's not even close to true, maybe yeah. a fraction of it. So why are you trying to sit here and belittle me? Like, it just, it just goes to show that when you're raised like that, where you're very spoiled and you don't have to work for anything, you're not going to turn out as, as what, what you should be for, for setting an example for other people and passing the torch to the younger generation. 100%. Like that speak that, like when you were talking, two things stuck out. One, he's insecure. Cause I think, yeah, you're, you might be worth 30 million, but you don't know how to fucking build that. Mm -hmm. Right. You learn how to build your wealth. You learn how to, you forged your own shit, right? Yep. He's insecure of the fact that you did that. Um, and two, he's going to blow it anyway. Oh. It, it is worth whatever. He's going to blow it. His dad already did. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they didn't. I don't know. But, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just sucks because it's like he, they went through a really hard loss lately and I, and I really hope that that is going to be a catalyst for change for their family. But I just don't, I don't, I don't know that it's going to be, but that's for them to figure out. I, I hope they do eventually. So what's your, why or your purpose that keeps you going? Um, my biggest why is my kids, dude. Like my, my family, um, like I said, we came from not having extra money. Like I didn't dive too much into like our financial situation because I don't know. I like I feel like everybody has the same story. I'm fucking dirt poor and now I'm rich. Like I mean, we didn't have money, so I just want to provide for them, but also teach them the right things that my parents weren't able to know. Right. So like I was the first kid in my uh, on in my family to go to college and get a degree. So I was, I was shown an opportunity and learned information that my parents never got a chance to. So it's my job to pass that on. So my why is just, um, just being the best version of me being the, and it's hard because I got this dark side of me that just holds me away sometimes, but um, just being the best version of me and like, providing a good lifestyle for my family, teaching them good, um, good ethics, good morals and, um, and being the one dude, to be honest. Cause like my, I think my dad is actually the one, even though financially he's not the one, his mindset changed our whole life or our whole life. Right. So like I attribute everything to him whenever I'm bitching about a long day, I just think to my dad, like working 16 hour days in construction, like he's, he did it. So I can do this. Like if I'm crying about cold calling, like my life is easy. Right. So, um, yeah, that's my why. I think it's my legacy, dude. Love it. How has spirituality or faith played into some of the success or, or what you've learned in this journey so far? Yeah. So I am a Christian. I went to a Christian school for college. Um, before that I was raised Catholic and, I have a pretty good relationship with God, I feel like, right? I pray every night with my kids. I show them, hey, this is what we should be doing to get ready for bed. Um, I thank God for the blessings that I have. And I think the biggest thing for me is like, if I'm in tune with God, I'm just a lot more grateful. Like even if something's going wrong, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to learn a lesson from whatever that is. Like God is continuing to teach me. so. When I'm connected with God, I do really well. When I like lose that connection, it, it's pretty rough. Yeah, I agree with that. So if you couldn't work in real estate, what else would you do? I'd, I'd coach baseball. Really? Yeah. So I like professional I'd coaching or no, well, maybe college coaching. Okay. Um, but eventually I want to start like a, an academy for underprivileged kids. So like take all the money I, I do in real estate because I played for a couple. Can you please stop doing that? Um, I, I played for a couple teams in California where they paid my way to play. Okay. 
can you? Sorry, Alec. That's all right. Um, they paid my way to play. So, like, if it wasn't for them, I would have never been as good with baseball. So I want to do that back. And so this is just kind of like a vehicle to a, a means to an ending. Mm-hmm. I want to have an academy. I want to have, like, a big-ass warehouse where kids can come in and hit and – throw and so that that's my like end goal i love it i have like a similar one um inspired kind of similar to like that where you know i was given opportunities with scholarships and stuff like that um through people that donated anonymous anonymously and also my mom when she was alive she she died pretty poor and it was really depressing to see but she was also one of the most generous people that I've ever seen. Like instead of like selling stuff, she would go donate it or she'd like find somebody that needed it and give it to them. She would, you know, tie it to, to her church all the time. Like, and she's just like, God's got me like the money's going to come back. And that kind of inspired me to, to look at things a little bit differently. So I, I have this nonprofit that I want to start eventually that benefits underprivileged children and, and providing them mentorship and opportunity and also uh, benefiting the families of, of cancer patients and also can- cancer patients because when they're going through it, especially if they're living on like disability or like social security, like they don't, they don't get anything. Like it, it's, yeah. it, it's less than a thousand dollars a month and you can't live on that, you know? So helping to take care of medical bills or transportation or, you know, um, helping them mentally as well, because they struggle a lot when, when they're going through that. Yeah. That's really awesome. Yeah. So I can help with that. Let me know. I'd love to love to collab on something like that. Yeah. yeah that's a, uh, that's a thing that I've had um, since pretty much the day my mom died. I came up with that idea. It's just, I've been chasing so many rabbits that it's hard for me to be like, okay, now's the time to start it. You know, yeah. what is uh, your favorite book? Favorite book? Um, Never Split the Difference. Great book. Now, like when I read that, my whole sales game changed. Sorry. Um, when I read that, my whole sales game changed. Like uh, the negotiation strategies. I think another thing I would have wanted to do after I read that book was be a FBI negotiator. That would have been pretty sweet. That would be sweet. So yeah, I recommend it. I mean, to your to your viewers, like if you are just getting into sales or experience in sales, read that book. Yeah. Likewise. So you kind of hinted at it. It's your dad who you look up to a lot. Who else mm-hmm. do you look up to? <clears throat> um. Well, I mean, both my parents like they just sacrificed so much for me to be here. Mm-hmm. Um, so both my parents, and then. Uh, a third, I guess, would be my coach, my college coach. Okay. So I got into a ton of trouble in college. I was suspended three times from the baseball team, put my head through windows. Like I'm telling you, dude, I had I had some problems as a younger as a younger kid. Yep. Um, and he was just always very um, he was always very graceful with me. Like he always understood, right? Like mm-hmm. And it's because of him that I was able to stay there and graduate because the school wanted to kick me out. And he wow. he said, no, like, we can't give up on him now. Like, in the moment that he needs us most, we should we should be by his side. So I got wow. suspended for like half the season on that last one. But just his – the way he is and, like, the kind of father he is – the kind of person and he's very connected with God. Like he wakes up every morning, reads his Bible. I like to joke around and call him like the second, the second coming of Jesus. Like if I could be like one person, it would be like my dad and him mix. Maybe you are, maybe you're becoming that. Maybe, hopefully. What's the final thought you want to share with the listeners before we wrap up? Thought. I mean, just staying with like the 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 idea behind Forge in the Fire. Like, some people may not have the same stories or struggles that we do, um, but there's there's minute struggles, right? And I think the biggest thing is just 
look at trials and tribulations as a, as a learning moment and give yourself some grace as well. Like I beat myself up a lot. I'm my worst critic. Like when I get in trouble, I hate when people are like, why did you do that? Cause I've already done it 200 times in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm starting to learn to give myself a little grace, but yeah, just give yourself grace. You're never going to be perfect. I'm never going to be the perfect entrepreneur dad, but I can try and do that every single day. One percent better. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So if the listeners want to connect with you and learn more about you, where can they follow you or, or reach out to you? Um, Instagram or Facebook. So Instagram and Facebook, I'm just Tino Luna. Um, shoot me a DM if you have questions. I'm, I don't have a course or anything, but I'm, I'm an open book. I, I like to... I'd like to think I know what I'm talking about. I've done it for four years now. Sucked the first 18 months, but done it at a high level for the last couple. So um, reach out. I'm, I'm, I didn't have the money to pay for mentorship. So that's another one of my passions is helping people that are just getting started that don't have the money to pay somebody. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, dude, I'm going to stop the recording here. But Tino, thank you again for coming on this i think uh i think we had a great conversation here and i hope those of you that choose to listen to us learn a lot from it dude thanks for having me on absolutely